Please see the link in the description to download a worksheet for this video. If you've got a machine like this, then you could take a bottle of water and carbon dioxide gas and make sparkling water. Carbonated drinks is the formal name for drinks with dissolved carbon dioxide, such as pop and soda. But if you gave that water to a plant inside this greenhouse and released that carbon dioxide gas into the air, then with a little time and sunlight, the plant will turn that same water and carbon dioxide into a tomato, plus give you some oxygen. A plant uses photosynthesis to make tomatoes. Photosynthesis is how plants use the energy in sunlight to make sugar, and sugar is the base of almost all food webs. In just a moment, we'll return to this magnified leaf, so we can see some details of how photosynthesis works. But before doing that, let's do a short review on plant biology. When we hear the word plant, many of us think of potted plants, but biologists use that word to refer to grass, trees, flowers, bushes, vegetables, and more. As we'll discuss near the end of this video, there are several other organisms that also use photosynthesis but are not plants. So it will be easier to define what a plant is when we compare them to these other organisms. Many plants begin their lives as seeds that come from parent plants. Seeds are mature plant embryos that will grow into a plant similar, or sometimes even identical, to its parent. Although we commonly call these nuts or beans, these are seeds. The parent plant wants to spread its seeds far away, so may use little parachutes that catch the wind. Other plants put their seeds inside fruits like this butternut squash. The fruits attract animals, who then take them away to eat the fruit, and in the process the animals help spread the seeds. This is an example of animals and plants helping each other. When a seed reaches soil and the conditions are warm and moist enough, the seed opens its shell and pushes out a tiny root, a stem and leaves, in a process called germination. At this point, the plant is called a seedling. If the plant is a young tree, then once it is a few inches tall, we call it a sapling. The plant continues to grow quickly by making branches, then growing leaves on those branches in a process called sprouting. Sprouting is the same name we use to describe new leaf growth on a plant of any age, such as during the spring when trees come out of dormancy. When the plant is big enough, it will then make seeds. Many plants use pollen to mix their genes with another plant so that their seeds will be as healthy as possible. Pollen is the yellow grains on the end of these filaments and are common in many flowering plants including this cherry tree. Some pollen goes into the air when the wind blows which is well known to those who suffer from pollen allergies. Other plants rely on insects to take their pollen to other plants and to bring pollen from other plants. To attract those insects, the plants make a sugary fluid called nectar. As the insects drink the nectar, they get pollen on their bodies, which they then carry to the next plant. After pollination, the parent plant can make seeds. To illustrate plant diversity, we are showing a dandelion plant since they may not use pollination to make their seeds. When the weather is harsh, some plants can become dormant, which is a state of low activity with almost no growth. In the fall, deciduous trees lose their leaves and evergreen trees reduce their growth. During a drought, the grass will often go brown for a few weeks but may not die. Here is a brief summary of basic plant biology. We have included some images with more detailed anatomy if you wish to learn that. Please pause this video if you wish. Now that we've reviewed some basic plant biology, let's go into more details of how plants combine carbon dioxide in the air and water from their roots to make sugar. Photosynthesis happens in the green parts of plants. Under high magnification, we can see many box-like shapes called cells. Each cell is an independent production unit, though they are connected to each other. Unlike animal cells that only have a cell membrane, plant cells have cell membranes and are aligned with cell walls. The cell walls are easy to see because they are thick. These cell walls are also strong, which is one of the reasons why plant material, such as wood, is so rigid. Inside each cell is a faint circular object called the nucleus. Like in animal cells, the nucleus of a plant cell contains its genes and tells the cell how to make the parts it needs to function. These tiny green objects are chloroplasts, and this is where photosynthesis happens. Inside the chloroplasts are chlorophyll molecules, 
which capture energy from light and convert it into energy forms that the plant can use. Chlorophyll molecules have a similar function to solar panels, since both can capture the energy in sunlight, then convert that light energy into other energy forms that are easier to use. In this schematic of a chloroplast, we're using gears to represent the many complex steps of photosynthesis. Those steps require energy, like a machine in a factory. Sunlight has energy, and when a particle of sunlight hits a chlorophyll molecule, it is converted into a form that can power the photosynthesis steps. The process begins when carbon dioxide from the air and water from the ground enter the plant cell's chloroplasts. Then a particle of light hits a chlorophyll molecule to activate the photosynthesis steps. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water as the inputs and produces sugar and oxygen as the outputs. Sugar has a similar function to a battery, since it's an easy way to transport energy. Sugar leaves the plant cells and enter these channels, which are called the plant's vasculature, which is how sugar is transported to other parts of the plant. Here is a summary of photosynthesis. Please pause the video if you wish. Now that we've seen a plant under a microscope, let's review a working definition of a plant. It is an organism that can do photosynthesis, has multiple cells, each cell has a nucleus and cell walls, and meets genetic criteria for being a plant. We call this a working definition because biologists often change classification criteria for organisms as new research becomes available. One important lesson about photosynthesis is that it is not unique to plants. We'll show some of the most famous examples. These one-cell organisms are called euglena. They have chloroplasts like plants but no cell walls and they can eat other organisms. In the 1860s, scientists could not decide if these and some similar organisms were part of the plant or animal kingdom, so scientists made a new kingdom for them. These are several types of phytoplankton that directly or indirectly are the food source for almost all ocean animals and are credited with putting about half of all the oxygen in the atmosphere that we and other animals breathe. This brown seaweed is called giant kelp, and like other kelp, it is not a plant. And the final example of an organism doing photosynthesis that is not a plant are these bacteria, which scientists believe were the first to do photosynthesis of any organism. Regardless of whether photosynthesis happens in plants or non-plants, photosynthesis is a key part in the carbon cycle and ecosystems. Please see those separate videos for a more thorough description of those topics. Plants use some of their own sugar to grow and to power their own function. To use their own sugar, plants use a process called cellular respiration. The input molecules on the left and the output molecules on the right are the exact opposite for photosynthesis versus cellular respiration. We're representing energy with a lightning bolt. In photosynthesis, energy goes into the process of moving the input molecules to output molecules. But in cellular respiration, energy comes out of the process of going from the input molecules to the output molecules. These two processes explain why the nutrients are recycled in an ecosystem, but energy flows out of ecosystems. If we think of sugar as a way to store energy much like a battery, then we can think of photosynthesis as the process of recharging a battery and cellular respiration is like the process of using the battery's energy. Like the energy in an ecosystem, to keep using the phone, we need a new supply of energy every day. And like the nutrients in an ecosystem, the phone's parts are the same every day. In addition to being the way that plants get energy from sugar, cellular respiration is also the way that animals get energy from sugar. We'll discuss cellular respiration in a separate video. Understanding plant biology has played a large role in developing methods to increase crop yield. Coupled with improved farm machinery, the agriculture industry is now so efficient that fewer than 2% of Americans work on farms yet can produce enough food for all Americans. This is a huge improvement from our colonial days when 90% of Americans had to do exhausting farm work. That was hard on them and their animals. Here's a summary of the topic we just covered. Please pause the video to read this if you wish. If you're interested in practice tests that are similar to state exams, but with detailed, colorful explanations for each answer, then please see our apps in the App Store. 
Many of these are free and none expire or limit their function. Since we only make educational products for children, none of our apps have third-party advertising, in-app purchasing, or connect to the internet. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified of future educational videos we make. Thanks for your attention.